I'm beginning to feel like my head is swimming. Of course, your suit is torn. The zombie takeout is getting through. And welcome to episode 523 of Zombie Take Up, the B Moving Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, just a quick mea culpa. So I realized over the week that I've been checking the wrong email for the John and Scotto account uh, for the last couple uh, of years. Yeah. Um, I We were initially going to cre- create this new show called The John and Scotto Show. That was going to take the place of Zombie Take Up. That was the original plan. Yeah, I almost forgot that we were talking about that long, long ago. Yeah. Um, so I set up the account, John and Scott Show at gmail.com. That's what the YouTube channel is on, and that's the email account I've been checking. I also, just as a backup, set up John and Scotto.com, or John and Scotto with gmail.com. That's the one I put on the website under the email link, um, and I haven't checked it in like two years until this past week or weekend. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in there from music and movies that have been sent to us. If you sent us something and we haven't replied yet, uh, I'm sorry. I just kept forgetting to check and you don't check that stuff. So, yeah, um, we'll be looking at it probably for next year. Um, like, next- I have a zombie takeout email address that comes to my phone so I can see, like, stuff that, you know, gets put in right away. Oh, zombie takeout um, account. We only have the one account for zombie takeout, so I check that, you know, a couple times a week. But yeah. uh, I, I just got the two confu- John Scotto accounts confused. So, yeah, we'll be going through all of that stuff probably over the, the break, and, you know, we'll get to it next year. Um, anyway, on to this week's movie, which is from 1965, Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet, continuing our 2020 trilogy. And, of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by dinosaurs. Maybe they didn't die off. Maybe the comet just took them home. Hmm. Uh, uh, also brought to you by No-Dose. Slip some into your popcorn today. Um, <laughs> Most have dozed off. You had a planned uh, line after my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So we have uh, the year 2020. And uh, man, did they have some high hopes for us, didn't they? Mm-hmm. That we were colonizing the moon already. And Whenever uh, you're creating planets. any science fiction, maybe don't set the date of it within the next like, 50, 60 years. Uh, you know, it's a fair guess. I mean, I, I can't fault them for that. What, 55 years ahead? Yeah, maybe. But, you know, they thought mm-hmm. we were... Going to land on I Mars. I mean, they yeah. thought... We're going to land on the moon in a few years, although right. they weren't sure we we're going to land on the moon in just a few years after that. I think they were kind of surprised mm. that we, we got there as fast as we did. Right. But the one thing no one ever counted for is that uh, we would just stop going to the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. And <laughs> Venus was a yeah. kind of a logical guess. Venus and Mars after the moon, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, right. They, they assumed we'd go through all the trouble of getting to the moon. Mm. We'd actually do something right. <laughs> with the moon. <laughs> Just say, all right, we took all the samples. That was fun. Um, well, we have yeah, gone to Mars like... with a robot a couple of times. Very true. Very true. I think there are we, atmospheric we've... issues with Venus. That's why we've never gone there. I mean, we never landed. Of course. I, think, I thought they even knew that back in the mid-60s how bad the atmosphere in Venus would be. <laughs> I honestly, I, I had to learn this looking up, look, researching some notes. Um, I honestly didn't even think rock, Venus had a rocky surface. It does, but it's under some very highly pressurized gas. Right. I, I thought they even knew that back when this was made. But no, I think we had to have a couple that, of flyovers first. I don't think it was common knowledge. Maybe. Or, or they clearly didn't consult. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> before making Nobody this was movie, consulted. But... Nobody scientific right. anyway. Right, so let's let's get to this plot summary. Um, we have uh, the the first manned mission to Venus. Um, they apparently didn't want to send a probe of any sort and didn't believe in sending the robot first. They wanted people to go there. Hmm. Um, they lost a ship on the way, 
And um, so I, I was under the impression that they were just going to kind of wing it, mm-hmm. which is like really not in the best interest of space exploration. Well, they <laughs> were launching from was, a space station. Said, what? They were launching from a space right. station, which is the one thing in the movie that's kind of scientific, scientifically accurate because it makes a lot more sense. Um, and the station got hit by a comet. Oh, the station got hit by, by a comet, I, I wiped out like one of the, the ships. Right, the ship, the third ship got wiped out. Yeah. The The station was still... The station was still was kind still... of functional, but it got hit by the comet and it took out the third ship. Yeah. Hmm. So they, uh, they're they going to wing it, but they, they instead of just um, going rogue, they actually sell the professor who's back at the lunar base... Hmm. Uh, on the mission, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, they didn't have any contingency plans or anything. Right. If they lost a ship, um, so then they, the first ship comes, it goes and lands, but they they lose contact with them, uh, and it sounds like they just splash down in, in some water. That unexpectedly, it was the last thing they heard from them. So they get a rescue mission to go down to get them. But of course, not taking into account. I, I mean, that they they don't fly around to find out where they are. Mm. They just make a landing and then yeah. try to figure out where they're at exactly, only to find they're still about thirty something miles from them. Mm. So they take this long trek across Venus, unfamiliar territory. Uh, they're they're gawking at things and and nearly getting themselves killed. Uh, I think both parties were, because of course it turns out the other party was still fine. Yeah, well, but they two were of them were one of them too. Off. That's true. One of them did die, and uh, oh, they they like lost one in this weird <laughs> lava thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, for some reason the robot wasn't assembled either when they landed, and they had to assemble, which none of that made any sense either. Um... <laughs> And the robot was named John. The robot, yeah. Yeah, the robot was named John. It was disturbing. (laughs) Uh, They, so they have all sorts of things that are never explained, really. Mm. (laughs) Some things that are kind of explained and some things they, like, there's no way to actually spoil this movie. Mm. It's just they... They land, they look for each other, they find each other, yeah. they go home. The biggest conflict was with lava. Yes, yes, the biggest conflict was with lava and with the robot having a survival mechanism in itself yeah. that, they had to, that they had to defuse or else they were going to die. And a big tentacled plant. Right, a few tentacled plants... A few Godzilla suits, which yeah. I mean, was probably my favorite part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, Larry Class- and Zeus. Classic Gorman. Um, although if they had sent probes, there would have been even less conflict. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. Now, I'm going to start with some trivia. Voyage to the Prehistoric Planet is a 1965 American science fiction film. One of two versions adapted for Roger Corman from the Soviet science fiction movie Planeta Burr, apologies for the mispronunciation, which means Planet of Storms, scripted by Alexander Kazantsev, I didn't practice these names, from his novel and directed by Pavel Klushanstev. Um, Curtis Harrington oversaw the editing and dubbing with principal portions of the source film uh, and directed new principal scenes featuring Basil Rathbone and Faith Demurg. The resulting new film was then syndicated to TV uh, by American International TV. So, yeah, it's just a Russian film dubbed with scenes with Basil Rathbone, with Basil Rathbone and Faith Demurg inserted Godzilla style, because, you know, it's like what they did with Raymond Burr in the first Godzilla movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Never released to theaters. And most of the, went straight to TV syndication, most of the credits in the U.S. version are fake to hide that it's a Russian film. <laughs> well, right, you can't, the, the very distrustful of Russians at that time, so. 
Right. Yeah, they never would have yeah, uh, let point. that go. Now, my first issue with the film, doesn't Voyage imply sailing? Well, right. I think, yeah, the 60s, they were doing a lot of comparisons of space and the mm. ocean. Right. Uh, which is, yeah, like Star Trek was just, you know. Yeah, Starfleet's like the Navy. It was pretty much the Navy, yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah, Voyage can be... You know, if you do approach it, it like and and you know seeing space as like water and, and that it's an inhospitable environment to humans, that makes sense. So yeah, I had always thought the word voyage just meant any kind of journey. Yeah. Oh no. Possibly. Well, no. It, uh, the the dictionary definition is a long journey involving travel by sea yeah, or in I've space. Only, I've only oh it says it does include space. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, Venus is very Earth like. Granted. At this, you know, in old science fiction, other planets were very Earth-like. I think H.G. Wells believed it was, you know, a, a sister planet mm-hmm. sort of thing. Okay. You know, that it was, it was just like Earth. Mm-hmm. We just couldn't see. And at least they had to wear EV suits. They weren't just like running around in, you know, normal clothes. <laughs> I really, for the first, I don't know how many minutes, I'm like, they're not going to be fucking wearing suits, are they? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to give them credit. The outside shots of the space station looked great. You know, when you see the, yeah, the ships getting prepped and such. I can't fault any of the effects or, yeah. well, or lack thereof because you're at 65. It's yeah. not a big budget. Some of them do go a little Doctor Who, particularly at planet side, you know, the, the, the tentacle plant that's very Doctor Who. Um, oh, right. <laughs> it's, my notes. it's like, it's some sort of fly trap yeah i wonder where it originated from <laughs> and the it's dub on su- the, nose. the dumb was surprisingly good the dub um yeah because it, it actually looks like they're for the most part saying what they're what you're hearing um although it sounds kind of muted compared to rathbone and demurg's dialogue right and and the lighting do, do oh, the yeah, russians the totally know how to, how to do lighting yeah like, who did their makeup? Yukon Cornelius or <laughs> Nook of the North? I mean, <laughs> what? And particularly Faith Demurg, because her face looked kind of gray, but she was wearing, like, a flesh-colored turtleneck. Well, she was not in the, the part of the Russian... No, but it, when it got to her, her face was gray, but her her you know neck and top were, were kind of flesh-colored. It was weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was very weird. All of her scenes were very weird because it was like, hey, we have a woman out here, but they were still kind of like, yeah. what are you doing? You know, <laughs> I really did ask when she asked if there was anything more she could do. I was totally expecting the guy to ask to make her make him a sandwich. Right. I was totally expecting that. And the movie has an absolute Corman trademark. Red scene transitions. <laughs> the screen just goes red. It's like a vampire movie. Right. That would have worked if they were doing a Mars movie. Oh, yeah. And, of course, you know, immediately when they land, one of the astronauts gets out, sticks his hand into a pool of liquid. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I mean... I was just hoping just it would be dies. acidic. Roll credits. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. <laughs> And the you mentioned the Godzilla suits. That was brilliant. They were like person-sized Godzilla suits. Really looked like yeah. Godzilla. Right. It's just, what the fuck is this? That's why um, I can't say like all of the effects were good. Because, you know, that was a little cheesy. The plant was a little cheesy. The hover car was really nicely done, though. Uh, Lucas totally ripped that off. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the land speeder. Gary Kurtz, who works on worked on the original Star Wars trilogy, is in the credits. I'm sure they just pulled the name out of nowhere. Um, yeah. I don't even know if it's reference to the same Gary Kurtz. That could be. Who knows? Yeah. He, he, I'm sure he was working before, you know. Well, this was just over a decade before, so I don't know, you know, if he was well, like did, a young like, ILM guy or not. Right. I mean, didn't, uh, didn't Coppola, you know, also start, you know, for Corman too, you know? Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't be that crazy to think yeah, Kurt's I, in here, too. Yeah, I'd have to look into that. Um, I did like the design of the robot's feet. I know that's an incredibly specific thing to point out. 
<laughs> but they've got like these claws on the front of them. A couple of like you know, uh, um, a bit of articulation. Very nicely done. Um, I mean, they they designed a they built a robot that couldn't withstand water, even though they were going to explore another planet with it. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't water he was going through. It was lava. He couldn't stand the water either. Oh, we couldn't do the water either. Okay, he I missed that must part. find shelter. Oh, the uh, rain, getting... right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, because he couldn't be in that rain because he's electronic, and you know, at that point, no electronics could be out in the water, or they would fry. I mean, did they? How long did they expect that robot to explore the planet? Though, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if he landed on his own, wait, it is too wet here. Wait, <laughs> there's too much lava. I should point out that Rift Trax has taken this movie on. Oh, thank God! I've not heard it, but it is. But I, I googled it. Misty hasn't touched it, but but Rift Trax has. So that's out there if you want to look for it. But honestly, no one can beat the voice over the the dubbing. That um, I, he's the buzzard from Bugs Bunny. His mother had told him <laughs> to go to Venus for dinner. <laughs> like. Who, like what was that? I mean, that they did a lot to try to match the lips and mm-hmm. the dubbing, so maybe that's why he spoke in that way. I, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly sure who you're talking about, but I do remember one kind of having a slight Russian accent. It was very weird. Yes. He talked like this. Yes. My mother done told me to get something for dinner. <laughs> I mean, and. I have to admit, the movie did fake me out a little bit, because when Marcia says she's going down to the surface to look for them, I just figured that was going to complicate everything. Right, and I was kind of waiting for things to get complicated, and <laughs> really didn't. Yeah. Oh, also, another bad effect, the, the octopus that briefly kind of interacts with Andre. When they're under Oh, yeah. Because it was just very Sid and Marty Croft. <laughs> this whole movie is like early land of the lost yeah, yeah. loved that the underwater stuff it was incredibly obvious that they were just shot behind or in front of an aquarium <laughs> and they find this statue underwater and right. they assume that it was some humanoid civilization that sank it could have been built by the dinosaurs who were aquatic they just didn't have enough imagination. Well, right. I mean, and not much is really resolved either. You no. know, I mean, everything is just laid out and theorized for the whole movie. I mean, yeah, you see, the, 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 there is life there. They they run into the dinosaurs and the, and mm-hmm. whatnot. And, and the, like one runs up and shoots one in the tail or something. Yeah. Like, what the hell was that even? And I was so hoping that little carved face one of them finds at the end would start speaking. <laughs> they said they were humans, not really. They're kind of humanoid. Um, actually, well, all we knew at that point was they have kind of humanoid faces. We didn't know what the rest of them look like. We get a hint at the end. Um, but before we get to right. that, um, I, 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 we need to get more into the fact that we were both completely oblivious to the fact that there were two groups on Venus. <laughs> I knew there were two groups. I mean, it took me a while to figure out that they were that they'd switched from one to the other though okay. at first until they had the robot and it was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, they that was the first group that they were supposed to be looking for." And it, I guess that's the problem when you have just nothing but white dudes yeah. in space suits <laughs> that all look kind of blue. Yeah. Because I did not realize it was two different groups. I thought it was the same group the whole time. And then suddenly, it wasn't until they they found each other that I realized, wait, there's both, they survived, wait, different groups? Wait, what? (laughs) One was supposed to be the rescue mission for the other. But yeah, especially when they had the same number of people, the only thing different, Mm -hmm. you know, making them different was the the one had a robot and the other did not. I just... That one passed me. Um, one had a car, the other had a robot. Yeah, loved the reverb on the one astronaut's, astronaut's brief inner monologue toward the toward the end. It was straight out of like a soap opera. 
Well, they did that with uh, Marsha too, didn't they? About oh, I hope, I hope we hear back from them. Okay, yeah, yeah, like, you're right. What yeah. is this? Why are we doing this? And of course, they blame Marsha for the whole thing. <laughs> I was really relieved when she didn't actually go down to the planet. Because, I mean, it, it just would have been a shit show at that point. Yeah. And, you know, so Andre, he's carrying around this rock. And suddenly toward the end, it splits open or he breaks it open somehow. No, he had to use a rock to open a panel on the, the gear, piece of gear they were keeping there. Um, and it splits open and there's this sculpture of a face... It looks very humanoid. And he says, they look just like us. It looked kind of like a Twi'lek from Star Wars. I mean, there were tentacles at the top. <laughs> they, I mean, there's so many things they just never <laughs> really come out and explain. Mm -hmm. Like the singing. Yeah. The... I was hoping it would, come, it would have come from that rock. Or from the, statue, right. the carving inside the rock. But, yeah, no, it's, it's still unanswered. And if Andre wanted to stay so much, they should have just let him. Right. And I also didn't understand, like, the whole... Wasn't the plan to leave the robot down? Well, the robot got destroyed in the lava. Right. But that was, like, the plan in the first place was to leave the robot mm -hmm. to explore. They're going to take a look around and then go. Yeah. But leave the robot behind to explore. Yeah. What that would accomplish, I don't know, no. since the robot couldn't transmit any information. Right. They back. ended up having to leave this other thing to transmit. Um, and then at the very end, and yeah, obviously we're just going to spoil the whole thing because there's nothing there to yeah. spoil. Um, there's a shot of this pool, and you see someone approaching it, and it turns out to be some a person, like the the pic, like the, the sculpture. Um you know, two little tentacles or, or big ears or something on their their head. Right. You see a reflection of it in the water. Yeah. As... And I like that it didn't pan up. You just saw the reflection. Well, right. They they did. You know, the makeup would have been ridiculous anyway. Yeah. So just it was a good choice. I mean, would it have been better to have actually met the creatures though? <laughs> I kind of like the mystery of it. Because I think the the problem with this is that that nothing actually happens in the movie other than them, you know, ne nearly getting themselves in trouble at mm -hmm. points. Yeah. On the sequels and remakes. You know, on the sequels and remakes. Now, I don't think there's room for a sequel. There's no room for a sequel. Uh, I don't want a remake. I could see a remake of some sort. I mean... You get, like, professional filmmakers to make it and stuff. <laughs> this, I just don't think the story is good. I mean, maybe take the concept, but there's a million movies like that. That's true. That's but true. What I would like to see is a properly dubbed version of the Russian original. Because that looked oh. like it could have been good. Hmm. But still, it doesn't look like anything happened in that either. Mm -hmm. See, I think this movie was a lot like... You know, like that first half hour of A New Hope where mm -hmm. 3PO and R2 are wandering the desert? Mm -hmm. It's like they took that and stretched it for an hour and 20 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I get that. And I think more happened on Tatooine. You know, one of them gets kidnapped and the other, you know, comes to, like, try to, you know, give for, for help and winds up getting captured, too. I mean, there was the plant and the Godzillas and the lava. <laughs> the Venus flytraps. Yeah. The, the on-the-nose mm -hmm. planet. Yeah. Plants. On the brains? On the brains. I actually liked it more than I was expecting to. I'm going three. I, um... I had to, like, rewind because I had, no, I had dozed somewhere during the last 20 minutes <laughs> so I would rewatch mm -hmm. and just make it through uh, I'm going one they they wow. couldn't even really keep the camera in focus mm -hmm. <laughs> for most of it so what have we learned ah uh, we learned you got to have a conflict in your story man <laughs> you just have to and I learned that 
Giving a rom- robot a human name is creepy, especially when it's my name. And it really backfires in the end. They turn out to be an asshole. You know, they won't mm. give up their, their life for... Yeah. But isn't a piggyback ride the least dignified yes. thing you could think of? Mm. <laughs> and then melting in lava. Yeah. And, and yeah, you would... How, why would they even think that a metal robot could cross lava? <laughs> I think it pretty the much melts said, everything. He was the maker of the robot, I think they were yeah. implying, right? Yes. That he made that robot and would know how much he could carry mm-hmm. and how what high uh, heat the temperature he could dollars, stand. Yeah. yeah, and yet... It's just like, oh, oh, I forgot. Yeah, it's got this self-preservation thing. We should really uh, shut that off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, this is so dumb. <laughs> That's it for Voyage of the Prehistoric Pond. Until next time, we'll be concluding the trilogy with Pacific Rim. This will be interesting because it'll be the third time I've seen the movie. The first time, I was massively underwhelmed. The, <laughs> the second time, I kind of liked it. So I uh, I held off. I went, I waited. I saved it for the show. So this will be my first time. I, it's it's so mainstream. I wasn't expecting to review it, so I just went ahead and watched it a couple of times. Second time, I liked it a lot more. So we'll see if that trend continues. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, you're always going to be in the middle of Milwaukee.